Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thanks for your attendance again today on this um, Thursday Overberg um, Zoom session. I'd, I'd like to introduce Mike Watkins this morning. He's going to talk about a very topical um, event in, in the world, um, climate change, and we really look forward to that. Just by way of background, Mike was born in Malta, spent his childhood in Ghana, and then Germany before attending boarding school in Oxford, so, so they let him into school. And um, in England and finished university at Swansea, Wales. He worked for the Rhodesian Geological Survey before completing a PhD at WITS. After that, he moved to UCT before moving to the University of Natal, which by the time he had retired, had morphed into the University of KwaZulu Natal. Currently, he is an emeritus professor at UKZN and a consultant geologist enjoying and undertaking work around the world. He also remains to um, achieving a life lifelong ambition, which I'll let him explain to us at the end of the talk. Um, so thanks, Mike. Thanks for making it available, and we look forward to your presentation this morning. Okay, thanks, John. Uh, you can hear me properly, can you? Yes. Yeah, Go for it. Okay, well, today apparently is Earth Day, World Earth Day. And, uh, and later on today, Joe Biden is going to be hosting a climate change conference. So I think we're ahead of the game here. I think it's amazingly good planning by the Overberg group to actually get a climate change talk on Earth Day. Except it won't quite be the same sort of climate change talk that you probably expect or used to, because I'm talking about cli how climate change has fashioned as a body and soul. So... Let's go. Now, some of you will be wondering, uh, has Watkey's done it again and put up the wrong talk? Um, no, he hasn't. We are an astounding species, and I always think that one of the, the pinnacles of physical activity for humans is gymnastics. But there I'm biased because when I was young, I was a gymnast. But uh, the other one, which is, is actually requires the same sort of physical ability, is ballet. And when you look at that photo, not only do you see a rather attractive ballet dancer, because I thought you wouldn't like to see me up there, but also you immediately know there's music involved here. Because we all know there's music associated with ballet. And if you think about music, it's quite amazing, because music is simply shifting air. And yet music can actually give us emotions. The movement of air can actually stimulate emotions with us. You can be sad, you can be happy. Uh, it can be bad music, it can be good music. But just that stimulation of air can do that. And the other thing, of course, is stimulating air is precisely what I'm doing at the moment, is language. So humans have evolved to actually respond and have emotion to actually motion in air. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about how that's come about. Uh, the other thing about this young lady and all of us is that isn't how we started out, of course, because uh, jo oops, geologists, oh, sorry, let me go back. Geologists all know that uh, life began back in the uh, Archean. Um, vertebrate life started in the, in the Cambrian. And it's basically the vertebrates that evolved from something that basically had a brain at one end, uh, a backbone and a backside at the other end. And then we've ended up with the species we have today. The other thing that's about humans uh, as well is the other aspect, not hearing, but vision. Uh, one thing is looking at a, a picture, but a picture can give you emotion. And this, this, it turns out, is the most favorite picture in the whole of the UK when they did a survey. The Fighting Temeraire by Turner. And it's rather topical because if you look at the date of 1838, this is considered to be a transition between sail and steam. That ship that's being towed to the knacker's yard by that horrible little steam tugboat was actually a ship of the line in the Battle of Trafalgar and is going off to be destroyed. And Turner, as everybody would know, I assume, uh, painted these glorious paintings of colour and motion. Uh, of course, the colour was due to volcanic eruptions. Um, but just looking at a picture can also stimulate our motion. 
And we are a rare species in the fact that we actually have color vision, not something everybody has. Well, in fact, something that some humans don't have, of course, as well. And painting goes back a long way. I like this painting from the Lascaux Caves because there's somebody there as a scale. Because many people see these paintings and they don't realize the scale of these things in the caves. Um, the Lascaux is one of many, but probably the most famous um, cave with paintings. You can't go into the original cave anymore. What they've actually done is they've done a, is a complete uh, life-size reconstruction. In fact, they're up to Lascaux 4, I think now, in the museum. But they are just magnificent. And it shows a painting has been part of the human psyche for a long time. Dancing, we don't know about. However, if you go to modern Stone Age people, they dance a lot. So dancing and painting must have been part of our culture for a long, long time. And that's what I want to talk about, our bodies and souls eventually. So climate change uh, really is a discussion that's been taking place over the last 20 odd years was stimulated by this uh, graph by Mann published in 1998, the original hockey stick curve, um, 1000 AD through to 2000 AD, getting all the data he could, could averaging it out and showing what has happened uh, since the end of, well, the end of the Industrial Revolution. This arbitrary date of 1880, that is, uh, whoops, sorry, which is um, put on the scale, is the one that everyone wants to try to keep climate change down to a change of one and a half degrees in a century since 1880. This hockey stick curve came in for a lot of flack almost immediately um, because it failed to show uh, some very well-known events. And in fact, what I'm gonna show you in this talk are graphs that actually predate this. Um, partly because I gave a talk recently about this, showing people what was out before this one got constructed. He subsequently actually produced a, another one with a data which was a little more realistic, uh, uh, or at least it reflected better what we actually see as opposed to, or we know about, as opposed to that particular graph. So, controls on climate change. Let's do a quite a quick revision. It's like a big boxing match at the moment between two groups of people. In the red corner, we've got the humans, the human-induced climate change. Agriculture started the rots with us, with deforestation. We even get people claiming that the uh, the beginning of rice paddies actually caused methane increase in the atmosphere. And then, of course, the problem with the Industrial Revolution, which started around about the mid 1700s in, in, uh, in England. And the, the real problem child there are pumping out greenhouse gases, CO2 and methane. Uh, just put a little reminder in there about what an at average atmosphere composition is. When we're talking about CO2, you're talking about 0 0.04 or less percent in the atmosphere. And methane, you'll see, is two orders of magnitude less than that. Now, methane is actually a worse greenhouse gas than CO2. But clearly, the problem has been that all our coal deposits were deposited over millions of years. And in a space of 200 years, we've basically taken all that carbon and chucked it back up into the atmosphere. Obviously trying to sort out what is actually human induced and what is natural is the big problem because there's no real good marker that you can use. So in the blue corner, we've got the problem of natural climate change, uh, Milankovic cycles, which is the orbital forcing of the Earth's climate, uh, change in tilt of the Earth's atmosphere, 41,000 year cycle, that's been the most important one for the last 15 million years, apart from the last 1 million. Then there's eccentricity of the Earth's orbit around the sun. There's 100,000 year cycles. That's been the most important for the last 1 million years. And the other one, the time of perihelion and precession of the Earth's rotation, that's on 24,000 year cycles. So Milankovitch back in the 19th, in 1930s on the basis of astronomical 
observations predicted these cycles in Earth's climate. And then in the 70s in particular, uh, work started to come out. I mean, most famously, Nick Shackleton and Keith and Irons on a, a core south of Cape Town uh, produced a, 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 a result from stable isotope work that actually matched Milankovitch cycles. But there are other causes. Of course, geologists have got to be involved. Volcanic eruption. Some people say it's all, all climate change volcanic eruptions. Uh, meteorite impacts, which can be pretty effective at times in the sea. Um, solar activity. There are solar cycles, which are a bit of a, a problem trying to actually see what they're doing. What will actually be quite interesting in the long run out of Mars is to see if you can match climate change on Mars to Earth to solar activity. And then, of course, continental drift, which everybody quietly forgets about because it's a relatively pr slow process. But to overcome that, I'm going to show you something which I hope will work. Let's see if I can get this to go. This is an old animation uh, that Colin Reeves put together from ITC. Um, Martin De Witt was involved, and in fact, it was actually one of Colin's post, uh, postdoc students that did this. Well, this. I like this because there's minimum geology in here, and it's, there are lots of, I've been told there are non-geologists here, so you don't get confused by what's going on with lots of names. Every, this is in millions of years here. So each frame is a million years as this moves. Colin and I had to agree to disagree over about the first 25 million years because there's no seafloor anomalies. But from then on, this is very well constrained by seafloor anomalies and um, models which have been produced since then, they're basically the same. So I'm gonna stop this in a couple of places. The first one is there, 65 million years ago. That's what the world looked like when the dinosaurs went extinct and mammals started to take over. India was an isolated island, Antarctica and Australia were one together at that time. South America hadn't joined North America. Africa and Arabia were doing their own thing because Tethys was between them and the rest of Laurasia. And then if we keep going to the other important Time, 38 million years ago. Now we're all familiar with 66 million years ago because it's the boundary between the Cretaceous and the tertiary, although we're not allowed to call it the tertiary anymore. And the 38 million year one is not so well known, but it's a really important event because this is the time India rammed into Asia. That's not a parking bay up here that was uh, preordained. That is actually the Himalayas, which are going to be shoved back onto Asia. Also around the other side of, of the planet this time, 38 million years ago, there are things going on which lead to the development of the San Andreas Fault. But the most significant thing here is this green line here, where Antarctica and Australia are going to go their separate ways. So for the first time, we have an opening around here, which allows a circumpolar current to develop, circumantarctic current to develop, and Antarctica starts to cool down. And from 35 million years to the present day, Antarctica has had an ice sheet because of that. And if we drive it on a little bit further, we come to the present day. And during that period of time, we have changes in the Drake Passage here, around the backside here, we've got North and South America joining. And so all of this has affected the ocean circulation. Now, my first degree was actually in a geology and oceanography department, uh, which is the reason why I quite enjoy getting involved in oceanography and I've been involved in some offshore stuff here. But this is the real key to the cooling of the planet. This is a little reconstruction from south of Cape Town down to Antarctica, the different water bodies that are in the Southern Ocean. We have the South Central Atlantic water coming down. The East Coast of South America is warm and cooling a bit as it goes across. Then there are various Antarctic waters here. The most important one being the circumpolar deep water, 
around the Antarctic, which is called the Coley, the Coley. There's an upper and a lower one, which you'll see why in a moment. The other important one is actually the water cascading off the Antarctic shelf in the Weddell Sea. There's a deep water going out here and there's some going back into the Weddell Sea. And that gives us the Antarctic bottom water. And the Antarctic bottom water actually comes up our east coast, comes up along the Natal Valley and this turns around uh, and goes past the Mozambique Ridge. But there's one above it, which is also going up the Natal Valley. That actually is North Atlantic deep water. And I'm, that is north, it's not a mistake, that is North Atlantic deep water. It comes down through the Atlantic, comes down our west coast, comes around into the Natal Valley and cascades in places over the Mozambique Ridge and continues out to the Mozambique Channel. And that's the one that actually splits this upper and uh, lower circumpolar deep water. You take that away, then this is one water mass. So cold conditions in the Antarctic are going to affect what's going on there. Cold conditions in the Arctic are going to affect what's going on here. And it's the motion of these waters shifting heat around, which actually is really very important. Um, so that's ultimately one of the controls on, on climate change. Okay, non-geologists around the place. Uh, let's just take a nice simple diagram. Here's our ballet dancer. Uh, she's changed gender and she's actually looking like a geologist now. But that body there has evolved ultimately from that body there. So this is 500 million years of evolution from a fish to a tetrapod, with something that started to walk on land into amphibians, into reptiles, then the first mammals, you'll see we don't necessarily jump like that. And in our case, our ancestors actually went up into the trees. Um, I was a gymnast when I was younger, and I was very grateful to our an ancestors when I was working on the high bar or on the rings. As you're whizzing around on the high bar, you're very grateful for those shoulders that you've inherited. And the rings, you know, get that wrong and you do a head dive into the ground. Fortunately, I used to be best at groundwork, so I never left the ground much at great heights. But that body we see here with a brain, brain starts there, limbs, limbs start back there. That has been entirely driven by environmental changes over 500 million years, and we can see where we come from and go to on a diagram like this. Right, again, non-geologists, okay? Just think of the geological time scale like this. Geologists do it upside down. We draw our tables from the bottom, the oldest at the bottom, uh, because that's usually where the oldest rocks are. So we have fish, amphibians, reptiles, dinosaurs, mammals, but for, for the geologists now, let's put some real names on there. Um, I'm going to test the non-geologists afterwards, so you better start learning these fast. This is a simplified diagram from 541 million years ago, which was the time of the explosion of life in the seas. Prior to that, you basically got soft body fossils. Around about here, we start to get the first proper hard body fossils. And this graph here just shows you times of when it's cold to the left, when it's warm to the right. And there have been a number of major glaciations in the last 500 million years. We can start with ones that were actually older than 500. In the late Precambrian, that time of the soft body fossils, we have the snowball earth where there were up to four glacial periods. Now that has been touted in some circles as the driving force for producing fossils with hard parts or animals with hard parts in this explosion of life here. But once we got those, we have a number of glacial, major glacial periods. This is the, the quadruple Nelson, the 444 million year old late Ordovician glaciation, which we find in the Cape Folbelt. Um, it's known as the Hirnantian glaciation. Hir in Welsh means long, and Nant means valley. The long valley glaciation, 444. Then there's the big one, 
which gave us our Dwika, the permacarbonation glaciation from 350 to 240. 350 is the way it starts in South America, and 240 is when it actually finishes in Australia. It's not that the glaciation moves, it's the supercontinent of Gondwana swung through the South Pole. So South America initially was at the South Pole, then Southern Africa, and then Australia. So it's a long lasting glaciation. There's a little short one here uh, in the Jurassic, on the Jurassic Cretaceous boundary, the time of the Moneng uh, meteorite crater. That doesn't produce any major glacial deposits. It's just confined probably to mountain ranges. And then we got our present quaternary glaciation, which is the ice age people always think about. So our little fish from down here has got to evolve all the way through all of these events to produce us at the top there. I gave a talk, I was invited to give a talk a couple of years ago at a conservation symposium as a plenary speaker because they wanted to know a little more about past, past uh, climatic changes. They didn't like this at all. I heard in discussions afterwards, uh, people were saying, no, no, this, this isn't what actually happens in the past. Okay, so we got that, trying to devolve from a fish through to us there. And then interspersed in there are extinctions of which these are the six major ones. But in fact, each of these boundaries here is an extinction because all of these names and boundaries were actually defined by paleontology, a significant change in the flora and the fauna at the time. So down here with this late Ordovician glaciation actually corresponds very closely to the, again, extinction event there. Uh, some people want to relate it to the glaciations. Others say, no, it's a, it's a gamma ray burst out in space that radiated the planet. And of course, you get people throwing in volcanism as well. Uh, then we have this um, late Devonian change over a long period of time. There's a, a quite an environmental change there over that period of time, like 13, 15 million years. Uh, to give this Devonian, uh, end Devonian extinction. Again, a number of events have been put in. And then the big one, the Permo Triassic extinction 252. Again, there's evidence for climatic change as we come up to that boundary, but that coincides with the age of the Siberian traps. And so the Russians are blamed for that extinction. Uh, the Triassic Jurassic extinction, uh, which is will be in our Elliott formation. You know, Roger Smith has worked across that boundary, looking at what's below and what's above there. And then the one that most people know about the extinction of the dinosaurs 66 million years ago, which is ascribed to uh, meteorites hitting the Yucatan Peninsula in South America. But at the same time, or actually just prior to that, that event, uh, there was an eruption of the Deccan traps across in, uh, in India. But this event is actually recorded within them. This one, this event here, that corresponds nicely to the central Atlantic magmatic province. That one there is Siberian traps. This one, there are various events, some of them across in Australia which could be part of that. Again, this is the same time as the uplift of the Appalachian Mountains, which is considered to be maybe the reason for this Ordovician glaciation. I think the only ones you're really certain about is this, this one here and this one here as the major event. Okay, so just to Again, if non-geologists around, geologists will actually know this. The mountains, the Cape Mountains you guys see down there, the Cape Supergroup actually span this period of time. As you drive inland, you go into the Karoo Supergroup. It spans that period of time. And down in the Southwest Cape, I don't know how anybody puts in the boundary between the Cape and the Karoo Supergroup. When you're down in, in Ceres and that area, when you walk in, to the Karoo there, it's really the Prince Albert's another area, really difficult to see where the boundary is between the two. Um, so it looks as though we've got a virtually continuous record 
from the Ordovician, maybe, maybe the top of the Cambrian, all the way through into the Jurassic in this country. It's a spectacular record. And then to see the rest of the record, there are some onshore basins, Oatshorn and those areas, and the offshore basins. So we have an almost complete Phanerozoic sequence going through there. Right, so we have some major climatic events to get through. We have some very short-lived catastrophic events to get through. Got to evolve through there. So what happens to a species when it hits or is hit by environmental change? There are basically two factors here. One is the amount of change, which I've put down just as low, medium, or high. And the other one is rate of change, slow, medium, or fast. So if you have a low, slow change, you can migrate. So like mammoths can actually keep migrating northwards during the Quaternary Ice Age. It's low and slow, you don't really have to evolve. You can stay within your, within your boundaries. The other one is medium rate of change, you're going to evolve. And grizzly bears have evolved into polar bears. And it now appears with climate warming, they may be evolving back, which is a slight problem for hunters because you're allowed to shoot grizzlies, but you're not allowed to shoot polar bears. So they have these ones that are in between and they're not quite sure to do. And if you have a fast high change, then you're going to become extinct. And I've shown a dead mammoth here uh, because they couldn't go any further north. They were walking northwards and they ran into the Arctic Ocean. They couldn't go north. So there's a, a red zone there of extinction. So we have been this all the way through. Our ancestors have found a way to evolve. Sometimes migrated, always managed to evolve. Certain human species or and human ancestor species have gone extinct. But there is actually a third angle to this, and that's the duration of the change, whether it's short, medium, or long. And so you've got to think inside this box. I know we've always got to think outside the box, but you've got to think inside the box. And if you do that, there's a very large red zone. It's actually quite difficult uh, when events come. If you've, got a, if you've got a long event and it's fast, okay, you have got a problem. So it's really, you're looking at these sort of events here where it's low and slow or medium in order to be able to survive and evolve. So this will just quickly go over our vertebrates the evolution from the Carboniferous to Jurassic, partly because uh, it's what Bruce Rubidge and his merry band of paleontologists love. It's a great record in this country, and we can see what where we've come from. We're going to talk about, first of all, anapsids. Anapsids are basically the first uh, vertebrates on the land which actually had a skull that actually held together essentially. Fish skulls fall apart. Eye socket, mouth, nostrils, and apsids there. And they evolved in the Carboniferous. You see the, the evolution from tetrapods into amphibians, and these are now the first reptiles. And they evolved into another character called a synapsid, which has got a hole in the skull there, a window. And that's where the plates join. And the reason for that is the jaw muscles actually connect to there. You get stronger jaws. There's another group called diapsids who actually had even stronger jaws. They end up with two places they could add, join their muscles to. And one of, those, one of those groups actually lost one of those. They went back to one window, uriapsids. They are extinct today. Well, they're the extinct marine reptiles, but of course, there's one of them living in Loch Ness, so it may still be able to see what a living one looks like. Um, and apsids are around today. They're the turtles and tortoises we have. Diapsids evolved most famously into dinosaurs. But prior to becoming a dinosaur, uh, the snake and lizards went off that way. 
in the opposite direction, I've got crocodiles and alligators. In fact, the only difference between a dinosaur and a croc or alligator at that stage is in the ankle, a slight difference in the ankle. And then the likely built dinosaurs, uh, things like synapsis that my graph works on up in Zim, um, they gave rise to the birds. So we have all of these skull types around today, except for Uriapsis. So what have synapses done? Well, they're the ones that gave rise to us. Mammal-like reptiles into mammals. And the record is just quickly in our, in Southern Africa, we have one of the oldest anapsids, in fact, probably the oldest anapsid that went back into the sea, Mesosaurus. This is the one that Alex de Toy recognizes in Brazil and South Africa, and one of the evidences for continental drift. It's about the size of a leg or uh, We have the oldest ancestors of snakes and lizards, Yangina. Um, in here, we have the first animal, bipedal animal in the world, Euparcaria. Took uh, mammals a long time to get onto two legs. And then slightly younger than that, we have the ancestor of the crocs and alligators, Ornithosuchus at that stage. But for us, the interesting ones become the dinosaurs here. This is not the oldest dinosaurs, the oldest dinosaurs actually across in Argentina. And we know Argentina is a breakaway province of South Africa. So we claim them for ourselves. But this is Massospondylus, uh, is the oldest pro sauropod, the oldest of the ancestors of the big dinosaurs there. Meanwhile, with synapsids, Cynognathus, and this majestically named Megazostrodon, he's about the size of a small mouse, the Mega is really optimistic, um, and that is where we go. Those are our ancestors there. So we've gone from something which is a reptile down here through to something that looks like a cute furry little animal there. Um, two important things I've spoken about. One is hearing. Is These guys' hearing is pretty bad down here. Uh, what happens is the jawbone evolves to give us our inner ears. All the bones are inner ear. And then later on with the eyesight, we're going to develop some colored vision. Now I'm going to jump now to, oh yeah, I have to say for the sake of the, the people who like to hug fossils, none of them were harmed during this reconstruction. So I'm going to jump now to a period of time just a little later. And without telling you what this graph is, if you look at it, I think that line there, there's as many data points off to the left as there are to the right. That's the sort of average running through that. And that's the climate change in the past 70 million years. So this is our KT, or we should call it the KPG extinction nowadays, the Cretaceous Paleogene at 66 million years. Dinosaurs went extinct. Mammals were around before this, but this is their heyday when they really come into their own. These data points here are DEL-018, oxygen isotope uh, data, which are converted down into temperatures here. And on this graph, that is the present average temperature around the world on there, zero degrees. So you can see that average that we agreed on the last 70 million years is actually a little bit warmer than here. And you can see there are some very much warmer periods of time here. This period of time to about 35 million years ago was much warmer than today. It's the greenhouse. And about 55 million years ago, we had a Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum. And that's about the time of maximum radiation of mammals, mainly because there was a niche there. All the dinosaurs had gone extinct. And the early Eocene climactic optimum was there. Temperatures getting off at 12 degrees warmer than today. Then Antarctic ice sheets developed 35 million years ago, and we start to see a stepwise cooling of the planet, ultimately the Northern Hemisphere ice sheets. So at this stage here, our ancestors were a bit like that furry little critter I showed you earlier on. But during this stage here, we go through an evolutionary process 
of going into a creature that lives in the trees and then comes down from the trees to give us our present body. After 35 million years ago, we say it's an ice house. It's not really an ice house, but in comparison, the temperature is coming down and down and down. And we go into the Quaternary Ice Age of today. So how's that temperature come down? We've got Milankovitch cycles, but superimposed on that are actually larger effects. That separation of Antarctica and Australia, that drop in temperature there is when that seaway comes through. And you get a circum uh, Antarctic current, and that's when the ice sheets develop and we're quite cold. Temperatures go up a little bit there. And the next time they come back down is here where the Drake Passage between North and South America widens. And then also North and South America join. That changes the circulation pattern in the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. The temperature drops down there 15 million years ago. And then two and a half million years ago, as India really pummeled northwards into Asia, it's uplifted the Himalayas, increase in rainfall, the monsoons we see today. That causes increased weathering and reduction in CO2. If you have water plus CO2, you produce carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is doing the weathering, gets washed down the rivers and gets precipitated as limestone in the seas. So that's this big stepwise cooling we start to see coming down here is this event there. If you remember, I said the Hyenantian event has been related to the uplift of the Appalachian. Same thing, increase in rainfall of 444 million years because of the uh, uplift of the Appalachians, CO2 flushed out of the um, atmosphere. And a couple of other things in here. What's this? Why is this so hot here? It's, it's enormously hot compared to what we can see there. And that has been ascribed to the opening of the North Atlantic. Initially, the North Atlantic was opening between Greenland and Canada. But about 55 million years ago, it actually took a different route and it opens between Greenland and Europe. It forms a North Atlantic tertiary province. So you've got places like Skiergaard in Greenland and you've got Skye and Mull uh, and the Basel province in, in uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and that event is considered to have caused the release of methane hydrates from submerged continental shelves. And that's pumped that into the ocean and the atmosphere. And we've got this increase in temperature to this 12 degrees warmer. And that is really what people are most worried about with climate change at the moment, is that if you do have an increase in temperature caused by CO2, that increase in temperature is going to release the methane hydrates, which are in the northern parts of Siberia, they're actually on land, but there's a very wide continental shelf north of Russia going out to the, towards the North Pole. And that's the real fear is this stuff is going to come into the atmosphere and it is worse, much worse than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. There's another little interesting thing in our evolution story and that's grasses. At about 35 million years ago, um, grasses changed into what we call C4. I want to go into the photosynthesis of this. The C2, C3 and C4 grasses. That, that is actually, that event of evolution of C4 photosynthesis has happened a number of times, uh, probably as much as 45 times independently in different plants. But the C4 grasses, that's 35 million years ago, coincide with this drop in temperature here. And there, that's a strategy which actually uh, makes them more drought resistant. And they remain sort of in the background until about 7 million years ago. And they became ecologically significant at that time. And since that time, with the cooling of the planet, we've had an expansion of grasslands. Now, expansion of grasslands actually gives you a, a new niche to move into. If you remember, in this period here, our ancestors were up in the trees. 
expansion of grasslands, you can move into the grassland areas. Synchronously with this is the East African Rift Valley started developing around about 35 million years ago from north to south. And that caused this sort of split between largely to the west you have forests and to the east you have grasslands. And the other event, which I know Bob Brain used to like a lot, was the Mycenaean salinity crisis about five million years ago, which was six million, between six and five million years ago. Uh, the Mediterranean dried up a number of times because the Straits of Gibraltar were closed. And that had a major effect on the, on the climate around the Mediterranean, which opened up what was woodland into grasslands. So let's look at that last period from the salinity crisis. Five and a half million years ago, we had the tail end of the, the Mycenaean salinity crisis in there. And you can see since then, the temperature has just been coming down and also getting more extremes between, between warm and cold. This is from an ice core in uh, Antarctica. Um, the quaternary uplift of the Himalayas two and a half million years ago, that occurs there. And this change I mentioned right at the beginning between the 41,000 year cycles, kilo year cycles, 41 kilo year cycles, which have been going since 15 million years ago, change to 100 kilo year cycles uh, at a period of time known as the middle Pleistocene transition between a 1.2 and 0.7 million years. And you can see, as I mentioned, there are longer, more intense cold periods compared to the average, dropping right down to here. And that has increased the, uh, the, the northern hemisphere ice sheets in particular. So where do we fit into all of this? Well, this period of time at the, at the uh, Mycenaean salinity crisis, uh, our, one of our ancestors, a character called Ardipithecus, who was basically arboreal, but would come down to the ground. But he was at a time where, as you can see with character here, I think therefore I am confused. Should I stay up in the trees or should I come down onto the ground? And this of course is where we have inherited our upper body strength and mobility. The, the, this species on our line of descent split from the African apes uh, a few million years prior to this. So the gorillas and the chimps were now going their own way and of course they stick to the forests. Then with the temperature ca coming down and we're getting more open grassland areas, that's when the, the famous Australopithecans uh, by, were now bipedal and moving around in savanna type areas. And then recently that uh, Australopithecus sedili was discovered. That's right at the end of the Australopithecan period. But notice they, they don't sort of suddenly change overnight. Uh, and there's an overlap with homo, man. So homo should really be human. Humans are defined. That species is defined by these things, by tools, homo habilis. But it's becoming certainly in, in East Africa and, and also down here in the cradle of mankind, suspiciously looking as if these Australopithecans also may have made tools. Um, but that's not going to change the names here. Um, but this is the beginning of what we would call man. And we always learn that man, the tool maker, separates out from other species. Okay? I think there's another reason why modern people have been separated out. And that, in archaeological terms, is the Paleolithic, Old Stone Age, but we don't use Old Stone Age or here. So this is our ancestry. And then we have evolved during this period of time of cooling in response to environmental change, which is due to climate change. Now I'm going to look next time scale I'm going to show is actually this period here from 800,000 years. But before that, I just need to show us, show you guys what the overall story is of Homo, if you're unaware of it. Homo habilis was the first 
uh, tool making species to be discovered by Louis Leakey. That was, was named Homo habilis for that reason. I have a slightly older one, Rudolfensis, because of Lake Rudolph in those days. Um, and that was around about two and a half million years ago. We now know that there are, we can go back to 3.3 million now, and there are tools of that period there. So we're back into the Pliocene. And in simple terms, Rudolfensis has evolved in the Habilis about two million years ago. Uh, one and a half million, um, 1.8 million years ago, you've got something that looks more like a modern human, Homo ergaster. And Homo ergaster was the first migration out of Africa, went across into Arabia and into Asia, and evolved in Asia into Homo erectus by about a million years ago. And the mini Homo erectus uh, the, in the island of Flores was uh, evolved and died only fairly recently. Meanwhile, back in Africa, Homo agaster evolves into Homo heidelbergensis. Now, I know it's got a German name, but it actually evolved in Africa. That's because the first type specimen was actually spotted in Europe, and then you backtrack like that. And Homo heidelbergensis came out about, of Africa about 800,000 years ago. And in Europe, they evolved into Neanderthals by 200,000 years ago. And Neanderthals have now become extinct because meanwhile, back in Africa, Heidelbergensis evolved into modern humans, went out into Europe and Asia. And that's where they eventually evolved into the different races we see around the world. So let's look now at the last 800,000 years. We're talking about Homo heidelbergensis onwards. Here's again from, a, from an ice core, CO2, methane, nitrous oxide. You can see how the methane and the CO2 are matching very nicely. This is the switch into the 100,000 year cycle from the 41,000 year cycles here. And if we enlarge that, here's another series of graphs again from another ice core. This one again from Vostok area, where we have got temperature here, warm, cold, warm, cold. Uh, we've got CO2 and we've got dust, which we'll see in a moment what that's about. So that's 800,000 years ago was the great interglacial. And then we have one, two warm periods, then the Eemian, which we see are now our coast quite nicely, the Eemian high there. Last glacier maximum there, and we go through to the present day on the right. Homo heidelbergensis in Africa has evolved during that period of time. Okay, 800,000 years to this, been through all of these events there. And this is a reconstruction of him. Uh, I've been asked on the behalf of Welsh Rugby Union to point out this is not a photograph of one of the hair bears who used to be props of the Welsh front row. However, I have to confess that I remember my student days playing against a side called Tredega Ironsides up in one of the Welsh valleys. And I'm pretty sure that this guy was the person who was jumping up and down on me, trying to cause physical damage to me. But uh, my memory might be a bit defective. But Holberg Einsensis in um, uh, the last of the of these groups is Naledi, about a quarter of a million years ago. Again, recently discovered, relatively recently discovered. But in our, in uh, Europe, Heidelbergensis has actually gone evolved into Neanderthals. And there's the old story that if you shaved a Neanderthal and put him in a suit, he wandered down the street, you wouldn't notice him. As I say, I think I noticed some things like that jumping up and down on me in rugby as well. Um, and they are now extinct, probably certainly within the last 40,000 years. It looks as if their last refuge was actually down in Gibraltar. And meanwhile in Africa, modern humans developed. Now, there's a couple of other things of interest here in that period of time. One is that line there, that dust in the atmosphere here. 
That corresponds to the eruption of the supervolcano Toba 74,000 years ago. And in the late 80s, a model came out um, that this event here reduced the human population, that's modern humans, down to maybe somewhere between 3,000 and 10,000 individuals. Now that is disputed by some people. Some recent genetic work says that actually could have been quite a good estimate, but it was a major event in human history. And another one which is a little more local is the Phlegrian event. The Phlegrian event is uh, as the Naples volcanic eruptions. And that occurred around about 39,000 years ago, amazingly cold periods straight afterwards, okay? Now, what's interesting here, let's go into our souls now. 45,000 years ago, the oldest known cave paintings in the world are out in Indonesia and they are of pigs. 42,000 to 43,000 years ago, the oldest known musical instrument is a flute from Glacen Klosterel. Anybody do speak Swabian dialects of German? I suppose that means goat cave. That's the oldest known musical instrument. 40,000 years ago is more or less when modern humans arrived in Europe. 45,000 years ago is only a few thousand years after we know modern humans arrived in Australia. So these people who dispersed, these modern humans who dispersed to Australia and into Europe, they were painting and they played music. And to me, that is what separates us from other species. I know Homo, the toolmaker, but modern humans have art and they have music, and that separates us out from everyone else. So let's go to the last 17,000 years. One of the problems with the, that inconvenient truth uh, presentation was the impression of the hockey stick curve is that that's what the world's climate looked like. People forget that that curve only went back to about 1000 AD, but people have this impression of that. So let's see what this actually looks like in the last 17,000 years. That's what the curve actually looks like. I've got to put a thing on here. Give me a moment. Okay, so this is a, this is a well-known curve. It was in JGR in 1997, well before, can you all see me still? Yeah, well before uh, the 2006 presentation. It's a nice one because it sort of exaggerates a little bit some of the events, but we can go through it. Last glacier maximum, 23,000 years ago to 18,000. Older Dryas cold period, then we have the boiling era warming, which is probably an overturning in the Atlantic that brought some warm water up. And then we have this cold period afterwards. This also corresponds to the Lacha Sea eruption in the Eiffel district in Germany. That caused a couple of centuries of problems of climate. And in fact, the Paleolithic culture dispersed from that area because of it. And that may have been responsible for the Gulf Stream shutting down, the warm water of the Gulf Stream shutting down, and we go into a cooling period, into which is known as the Younger Dryas. And then there's this asteroid comet theory from about around about uh, 11,000 BC, uh, which wiped out or was considered to have knocked out the Clovis culture in North America. Um, Again, that is disputed in certain quarters. So the Paleolithic era, which lasted back to as long as 3.3 million years ago, actually transferred across into a Mesolithic culture at about this time. And that's our transition into, into settlements. If you look at that curve, if you don't have that boiling warming, warming there, that curve actually goes up quite nicely to there. It's rudely interrupted by these events. So that was a climate-driven event to change from being a hunter-gatherer
to actually having to be in settlements and of course starting to tend crops and animals. You get warming at the end of the Younger Dryas and it's, it's a very rapid warming. This event here, by the way, here, the sea level went up about 16 meters. It was going up as much as five centimeters uh, a year at one stage. Okay, so warming at the end of the dry, the warming of the younger driest, one of the oldest settlements we know in the world is Jericho, one of the oldest continuous settlements is Jericho at that stage, and then the famous one in Turkey called Bekli Tepe. Then we go into the Holocene warm period, and that is when we see Neolithic farming develop. That developed initially in uh, Turkey, Anatoly area, but to spread out into places like southern Russia and across into the Indus and across into the Nile Valley. And a significant event here is when, with sea level rising, it spilt over and filled up the Black Sea around about 7550 BC. And some people, that, that dispersed people who were already farming in that area. They were good soils. The southern part of Russia has really nice black soils, Ukraine as well. And that dispersed people out and probably encouraged the Neolithic farming in a wider area. Then there's this 8.2 kilo year event, which is a, a cooling. And that's caused by the ice sheet in North America. Laurentian ice sheet is retreating. In front of it, to the south of it, there's a large lake. As it's retreating to more or less the position of the Great Lakes today, it actually gets lifted. And the water, the cold, the cold fresh water, slides under that ice through the Hudson Bay and into the North Atlantic, so it shuts down the Gulf Stream. So there's this cooling event that lasts a few centuries there. For those of you who want to know where things fit in the Neolithic, Stonehenge is probably one of the most famous sites that uh, develops over a period of over a thousand years at the end of the Neolithic, just going into uh, the Copper Age, as you see in a moment. Uh, and that more or less coincides with the invention of the wheel in uh, the Near East which coincides the beginning of the Copper Age. And in fact, our major civilizations, such as the Egyptians, 3.1, sort of around about here, uh, Indus Valley, same time, and Mesopotamia, same time. And then we get the invention of writing, the cuneiform writing, this proto-writing before that. Just a matter of interest, that's the oldest surviving tree in the world. It actually just about goes back to the age of that oldest civilization. And the Great Pyramid of Giza was built partly in the Stone Age, but largely in the Copper Age, around there. And the, that's in the Old Kingdom. And the Old Kingdom came to a grinding halt with this 4.2 kilo year event, an arification event, which is seen in many of the civilizations, but not necessarily all around the world, um, and big environmental catastrophe at that time. We go into the Bronze Age, extinction of mammoths there, and then into our Iron Age. And this is where we see this almost this historical known warm period for the Romans, where we had vines growing in Britain, there's the middle medieval warm period uh, and then the little ice age to get us to the present day. Now, my thing about the body, uh, evolution of our body has actually been driven by those climate changes through time. We had to evolve to adapt to those. Our souls also have been partly that. But one of our big problems, I think, with understanding climate change of the present is this. There was a little ice age in Europe. And the logic by many people when you talk to them is that that is the norm. At that time of the, the European Renaissance, that's the normal temperature. Because that's when 
all the infrastructure, all the agriculture really developed in Europe. And so changes from that temperature are a bit of a problem. It was quite an insight when we had some people from the climate panel uh, come and talk to the University of KwaZulu-Natal to listen to them, because then I really did appreciate that actually, although they're talking about ecological catastrophes and things like that, the underlying theme the whole time was it's our modern infrastructure we're trying to maintain. So let's go to a little closer to home here. This is a, a paper that's either just come, it's just come out in the South African Journal of Science. Tom Huffman, an archaeologist, and Stefan Woodbourne. Stefan discovered that baobabs actually do have tree rings, and he's done some really good work on this. Uh, can't get temperatures out, but he can get whether we've got wet or dry, wet or dry conditions going back through time. And he and Tom have cooperated and they have identified these periods of severe droughts. I mentioned me being a gymnast in my youth, like in groundwork. Tom Huffman was a pommel horse man. He didn't like the groundwork. Okay, so close to the home. Iron Age people, the Bantu. Bantu migrated out of uh, the Cameroons around about 1000 BC, went west into West Africa, went across to East Africa, and they also migrated down the Atlantic coastline, uh, eventually ending up in South Africa. So the, the first guys arrived at about 250 AD on the eastern shores, the oldest site we've got the eastern shores of Lake St. Lucia, they actually came down from East Africa. But another group who came down that Western route, they arrived in the Eastern Cape around about 450 AD. Uh, some of them stopped off on the way, and those are the Shona up in Zimbabwe. So the people who originally inhabited the Eastern Cape, the original Bantu, were actually related to the Shona. And that's the early Iron Age. Then there's the Middle Iron Age, which is a time of a second migration, which came down from uh, East Africa, down to Southern Africa. These are the Swana Sutu people who came down a sort of inland route and the Nguni people who came down the coastal route. And then until an arbitrary date of 1850 is the late Iron Age, where we're talking about the, the Bantu farmers bringing Iron Age with them. In fact, their, their iron they produced, they used to smelt, was actually of a higher quality than any European iron until the Bessemer process was invented in Europe. So they were pretty efficient at it. So Mapungubwe, famous site in Limpopo Valley, was occupied for this time here, 900 to 1320. It gets abandoned at that time of that drought and the people move up to Great Zimbabwe and develop the culture there. This is the period of the Little Ice Age. If you go to Europe, the cold events in the Little Ice Age, there are three of them, were more or less about 100 years apart, like that. If you go to the cold event here, it's different. It's from 1690 to 1740. So taking this stuff from Europe and transferring it down to other parts of the world, the Ice Age, is a little bit of a problem. There is another significant event here, is that little red dot there, which is 1652, uh, which is obviously the time the Dutch put the first settlement into the Cape. And it's quite interesting to see that that is actually the period of time when it's relatively dry in the Limpopo. They've just gone through very dry period there. So these people here have a different sort of um, background, if you want, to what Europeans have being pastoralist farmers and trying to deal with these drought periods, as opposed to people up in Europe dealing with these ice ages in the air. So what I've tried to do is just show how climate change has happened the whole time throughout Earth history, and we've handled it going right the way to from there to there in that climate change that we as modern humans actually had music and art built into us 
as we emerge. Modern humans emerged around about 120,000 years ago, and certainly by 45,000 years ago, we can see that migrating out of Africa, this was taken with us. And going back to slightly more recent time, those of you who can remember this very nice group called Supertramp, they had an album called Brother, Where You Bound. I think moving on from that period, we can probably change that cover of the album to something that looks a little more like this today. Okay, that's the end of my talk. Thank you, Michael. Lots of lots of um, room for discussion. So um, let's let's open it up to to the floor. If you want to download or unload your your yeah. presentation and then get you back on the screen and we can see that you're still there. I'm still here. Don't worry. Okay. I just got the mouse to stop working. I thought it was well articulated. Very well done. Yeah. Right. Question time, people. It's yeah. If you you can either text it or you can put your hand up uh, in the question. It's always scary to ask, but if I may just you know, ask a, 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 they say there isn't a stupid question, but this one is, in, in that box that you drew, Mike, where in that box do you put us now, that box that we must look inside? That box to look inside. We're in the evolve part. We've got to evolve. But in, in which color zone are we? Are we on the edge of the road? We're, green zone. We're, we're, the either, we're either going to have to migrate or we're going to have to evolve. And if, you, if you're going to go live on Mars, you're going to have to evolve. <laughs> May I ask, uh, Michael, you showed the migration of the species from Africa and the various types of humans that evolved. Yeah. Is there evidence of interbreeding between modern Homo sapiens and, say, the Neanderthals? They yeah, yeah, there is. That we all have a, a proportion of Neanderthal genes inside us. Um, and interestingly enough, that if you look at the, the proportion, it actually gets higher as you move across to Polynesia. So it appears that the, the first, you know, the, initially you're coming out of Africa, there's some interbreeding taking place. Probably they're clopping, getting rid of the men and keeping the women, the usual tactic when any invasion takes place. Um, and the guys who've actually gone eventually across to Polynesia, they seem to have more Neanderthal genes still in them because there haven't been successive waves of modern humans coming out and, and uh, interbreeding with them. Uh, Mike, can I ask you a question? It's Mike Devitt here. Yeah, I see that. Okay, <laughs> good. Great presentation. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah. I was, yeah, excellent. Uh, just on the um, the uh, um, late Ordovician mass extinction, I, I was led to believe that there were two pulses within one million years, and um, the, the sort of conclusion from all that was that um, all major extinctions really had to have to do with global warming rather than than the ice ages. Would you yeah, that, yeah. No, that's yeah, that's true. That we, if you, if you look at those ice ages, only at the Hernantian do you see anything that looks very close. And the, yeah, there's, there's, a, there's a Hernantian cold event, and then there's the extinction event. Now, the extinction, I say some people want it as a, as a gamma ray burst that's causing, that's wiped everything out. But they are just slightly separate. They are slightly separate. Right. Okay. I think with cold events, you can handle it. It's, it's, it's a short, sharp, you can't handle it. Because a lot of the, <laughs> other, right. <laughs> the volcanic ones church, um, cause chemical changes to the atmosphere and the water. Right? A bit more right. than just a temperature change. Great, thanks. And, and Mike, just a little comment on you know the sort of so-called carbon um, or atmospheric carbon running away from us. I mean, you know, that's just that's just what it is. And what you're saying is we need to adapt to that. Or, or is it real? Um, well, it must be real because we were measuring yeah. it. But um, 
I know there is a there, there are some problems with the uh, the terrestrial measured and the remotely measured temperatures diverging a little bit around the place. That's obviously got to got to be sorted out. But the the real issue is is us. There are too many of us, and we're using too many resources. Well, now you now you've got to the real problem or the real challenge yeah. that no one's prepared to address. Yeah. Yeah, we we um, we had. I mean, I say when I when I was a student. <laughs> I mean, this is what I used. To, this is what I used to hate. You know, when you were a student, some aging professor would stand up and say, "Well, when I was a student," and he'd bang on about fixing airplanes with paper and glue and string after the First World War. Okay, so I'm always reluctant to talk about when I was a student. However, when I was a student. Um, there was the two Ps that was the biggest concern. One was pollution, one was population. And I think we'd all have been horrified at that stage to find out that, you know, 50 years later, the, that they've just been twisted around. Populations have vanished off the, off the agenda. Yeah. And I think for two reasons. One is there's a religious region, reason. I mean, Bernie Sanders recently in, in the, uh, the primaries he, he said something about third world women should be allowed to get access to, uh, to the pill. And he was told, no, Bernie just doesn't want little brown children. It was turned around on him. Uh, and, the, and the other one with population, of course, is e economics. You need an expanding market to keep the economy going. The expanding market means more people. And the Chinese have, have stepped across the line now. They've dropped their one child policy because they are now basically capitalists. They need an expanding market, internal market. And at that, it was quite interesting at that uh, the climate panel meeting I chatted about, a lass who was talking about uh, food security, and said, no, no, it's not gonna be a problem in 2050. We'll be able to feed 10 billion people. And you think it's not just feeding 10 billion people, it's all the resources people are using. And, uh, and it's a nightmare. And the other one is pollution that everything's been turned around now to CO2. All the other pollutions just vanished to the background. Yeah, well, I mean, people and, sorry, people and pollution are, are probably the biggest, you know, challenges that we're all blind to. I mean, we, you know, we live in this lovely part of the world, which is actually very clean, but walk along the beach for an hour with a plastic bag and you fill it in no time. It's, it's quite scary. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I do these research cruises where you're out in the middle of the ocean watching Plastics are bobbing around you all the time. I mean, it's just crazy. But and and that is not really being being uh, addressed. When is the population growth going to stabilize? In in some European countries, it would be negative if it weren't for immigration. But in other parts of the world, it's just going up and up and up. What level are you going to get to where you you just can't sustain it anymore? And I I don't believe you can sustain it at Talking about 10 billion people, uh, how many of them will give up a cell phone? Yeah. Well, I mean, that, you know, that, I mean, that's the other irony for us geologists. I mean, you know, we too have this dilemma. And Tanya, I think, is on the call and touched on it. You know, talking about ethics. Well, you know, it's wonderful to see the mining companies all now, you know, making a a huge amount of money but when you actually look at the projections and the amount of copper and iron ore and 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 that's needed to come out of the ground i mean it's it's actually quite frightening to to look at those figures and and yep. yes it, it's been driven by china and it's been driven by things like um you know cell phones and you go and look at the the pollution and the child labor and you're not going to get away from it in places like the congo you know, I think us geologists really need to really think about, you know, what we're talking about when it comes to ethics and, and how we fit into this pattern. <laughs> I remember years ago at a Brian. Can I add to this, John? Hmm? Yeah? John, can I add to this? Morning, Mark. No. Carry on. Okay. Um, you know, this whole thing of, uh, 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 of climate change, and we've been talking about it in the last few minutes of population but not only is it just the population it's the rate of growth of that population since i was born the world's population has nearly increased three and a half times that's in a, year, a period of 70 years 
That's a monstrous amount. When you look at the consumption, and we're talking about it, there are not enough cows and sheep and pigs in this world to feed us all. And there's not enough land actually to feed us all. So we have to deforest. And this is quite ridiculous to think that we're actually the most populous mammal. There is not a mammal that's ever reached the continues to grow. This population of ours. So it makes more holes in the ground, so it destroys the sea. And the point that we're talking about CO2 being the only uh, pollution we talk about. Another one that that's, seems to be coming into the foreground at present is plastic pollution. And it, people are now talking about it. And a, a, a case in point is that a few years ago, um, the manufacturers of soap added small plastic particles to their shampoo, uh, which they then said would scrub our hair. They've stopped that because those thousands of particles went into the sea and they're never going to break down because they're never exposed to sunlight. And it, work has now shown that a lot of fish and a lot of other animals have got a percentage of plastic in their systems that they never had before. So there is an enormous amount of pollution that we're contributing to on this planet, not just CO2, it's a lot of stuff. Yeah. Okay, back to you, Mike. You were saying thanks, Keith. <laughs> Years ago, at a bry with Andy Killick was there, and I, you know, is Andy on this? No, he's not. Um, I said to something, something to the to him, you know, I tell my students that geologists sometimes have a responsibility not to find ore deposits. And he said, of course, Andy working, I think we're still working with JCI then. He sort of castigated me over this. And I said, there are times when you, you walk away from, if, if it's in certain areas, you just, just walk away from it. I mean, I, when I was down in the Antarctic, I saw some very nice costumes there. Now, fortunately, mm -hmm. the geologists I work with, these North Americans were totally academic. I could look at them very nicely and then walk away from it. You don't tell people these things are there. It's crazy. Yeah, that's definitely something we people need to think about seriously and perhaps have a debate. And, you know, what are we going to do about preserving Mars and the moon and all those other exotic places that we now seem to be wanting to conquer, having conquered the Earth? How can, how can you mine? I don't never understood this. Why do you want to mine the moon? The moon consists of basalt and the north side. If we're not mining the Karoo basalts, why the hell are we going to the moon to mine basalts? I can't work this one out at all. <laughs> Good point. Yeah. Right, more questions. We've got some, we've got some text here. Uh, the, the question there about, uh, do you have a comment on the 1815-17 Tambura event? Well, that was, that was one of the, the events that actually uh, inspired Turner because when as a young man, he saw these amazing sunsets. So it was a couple of centuries of, there was sort of, what's a, two years of no summer, I think Tambora was in Europe, but the sunsets just went on and on and on. And that's, that was one of the driving forces for his painting. Mm. Okay, and then there's, there's the question, uh, what's your opinion on origins by Lewis Dot now? Origins, our origins. How Earth was shaped by human history, a very worthwhile read, according to John Blaine. No, they, well, our, uh, we have been shaped by the Earth, uh, which I hope I can see from there. And what's happening now is we are sh trying to shape the Earth. But in, mm -hmm. in, the, in the long run, if you, if you all think about it, uh, we are going to go extinct as a species. Every species goes extinct. It evolves, either evolves into something else will come to a grinding halt. Uh, so ultimately, we're going to have a major problem. The resources are going to run out, um, and we're finished. I think that's the one we all need to grapple with as well, Mark. Yeah. I'm sure. <laughs> and, and trying to live on Mars is just bonkers. Um, Mars doesn't have a magnetic field. You, you can't live on the surface of Mars. If, if, if life could be on the surface of Mars, it would be there. And, you know, it's going, if it's anywhere, it's going to be underground. But you, you've got to live within eight minutes of a fallout shelter because of solar flares. Mm -hmm. The reason why we have life on this planet is because we have a magnetic field. It's not just water. Without the magnetic field, we would be bombarded by these solar flares. We'd also have uh, the atmosphere stripped off and the ocean stripped off by the solar wind. So, you know, they have all these reconstructions of people living on the surface in colonies in Mars. That won't work. No. 
um, Michael. Um, Henny read out my question about the Tambora event. Mm. What he what he didn't read is the last portion. You didn't show it on the African portion, and I wondered about its relationship to the Difficana, um, the whole Difficana in in Southern Africa. Whether that was a climatic event. Yeah, but ta Tambora was, um, as I say, that it was that cooling event. Yes, that, that one, that one in the sort of uh, late 1600s into the 1700s that caused major problems. Um, that drought event. Tambora was less because the 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 ash actually went the other way. The ash went went east rather than west. Um, but there's also the other the other one to think about as well. With when you start looking at our history is the East African volcanoes. What was going on there? Trying to get a decent uh, chronology out of there to see what's going on there, how that's affected us. I mean, it's the, the sampling in Lake uh, Malawi is quite interesting, trying to match things up there as to what's going on. Uh, I, um, John, Henny, Peter, yeah. I've got a question for Mike. Go for it. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Michael, you, in the very beginning, you were showing the uh, very complex structure of the, the ocean current. Um, if there is time, would you like to just enlarge a little bit on your view of the extent to which humankind can, could control climate, both locally and but perhaps more in a, a global sense if humankind was able to manage ocean currents that's the the comment that if you have any uh, view on uh, there have been some well, there's some work has been done not so much in managing the currents but managing composition for instance slinging a whole of iron filings into into the ocean to cause a plankton bloom. Plankton bloom means that you're producing more oxygen. Um, they're enormous currents. I don't think we have a chance of controlling them. They're enormous water masses. And they are important. I mean, talk about plankton blooms. I, I had that uh, deep water coming down off the shelf of Antarctica, but actually frozen into the Antarctic uh, are plankton, and they get released every so often as blooms, so they are really important coming north again. They come up our, our west coast as, as plankton blooms. But you're talking about huge water masses here. I mean, offshore of South Africa, what it's, Natal Valley is 4,000 meters deep. And just the surface water basically is actually the, the Gullus current going south. Underneath it, there are these two huge masses which are heading northwards. Right, fascinating, Mike. Any, any other last questions? Everyone done for the morning? Thanks, Mike. That was tremendous. I'm sure you're going to get some follow-up and some questions. And we, okay. we really appreciate the effort you took to prepare the presentation and and um, a whole lot of thoughtful stuff for the for the future, particularly for geologists. And maybe we've got to get you back on the on the pedestal. Um, you know, later in the year to, to to follow up with some of your other ideas and thoughts that you didn't sort of cover today as well. Oh, we've got one last, one last thing for today. today. Today is Earth Day. Yeah. But Sunday is World Penguin Day. Okay, so we should all be out there looking out for the penguins. That's right. And penguin is one of the, probably the only Welsh word that's ever made it into the English language. So this is also <laughs> Good one, our penguins. Peter van der Spey has another question for you, Mike. Yeah. It's a question for you, Henny. When will this talk be available on YouTube? Hopefully never. No, we still have to think about that one, you know. We're going to vote whether we actually do the story. But it should be by, by tonight, tomorrow. It should be on. I'd, sorry, I didn't mean on YouTube. I meant on uh, accessible, because I'd like to recommend quite a few people to to read or to visit this talk, Michael, I found it illuminating and something that 
digestible for people who don't come from our geological and time frame discipline. Yeah, I agree 100%, Peter. No, we'll have it on to YouTube. Gert and Henny are very good at that. And Nolene, I think, has left, but she's our sort of backup girl. And thanks to Nolene for all the hard work she's done. But we'll make sure you get a copy of it very shortly and, and please distribute it, absolutely. And thanks to, your, thanks to your comments. But again, Mike, thanks very much. Um, any, yeah. any last questions? Any comments, Mike? No, me. No. Uh, and I'm, I'm impressed that you actually played rugby as well in, in, um, in your distant past. I play a lot of sport. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 um, I, used to, and I, played, I actually played, I played first class hockey when I was playing rugby. I used to play hockey in the morning for Cardiff and rugby, had to go and play rugby in the afternoon. If it was the okay. other way around, I couldn't have managed it. <laughs> ballet in the evening. Well done. I, you know, I wanted to be a ballet dancer. My mother never left me. Let me. <laughs> Thank goodness. <laughs> so those, yeah. Not in those best. No. <laughs> okay, and will you or Steve send us your physical address and then you can fight about, you know, who gets the wine. Someone's got to send us a physical address, otherwise we can't reward you. Well, if McCord's still in line, I'll go and send his address. Okay, I'll, I'll send you an address. Then. Okay, fantastic. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Mike. That was tremendous. Okay. All right. Last right. time. Going, gone. Thank, Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thanks, Eddie. Thanks, Ed. Well done.